Shalom, y'all. So, um, it's been a minute since I've done a YouTube video. Um, I've been trying to put this together for about a little over a month now. I had sort of a, a perfect storm thing happen and it kind of ruffled my feathers and God kind of did a drive by and dropped some information in my brain. So, um, it, on several occasions and I just I uh, audio recorded it and I'm finally putting the script together and um, I kind of felt like maybe today might have been the day to put it out since it's um, the day that Christ was crucified because it kind of has to do with a, a disturbing trend that I'm noticing lately um, it's mostly Paul but I don't know just just let me know what you think or don't let me know what you think it's up to you i i just feel like i have to put this out there and i felt like today's the day to do it so here goes i it is scripted it's all genuine but it is scripted so i don't go off on a tangent because whew, i've had to edit this several times because i went off on audio tangents so i'm noticing a disturbing and interesting and troubling trend on christian social media on all platforms so many people seem to be obsessed with the Apostle Paul a little bit more so than Jesus Christ, it seems. And before I explain my observation, I will say this. I am very grateful to Paul. I am a big fan of Paul. I aspire to be as dedicated as Paul was. Ephesians is probably my favorite epistle of the New Testament, especially since I'm a spiritual warfare intercessor. But nonetheless, here's what I started observing on social media. And the truth be told, this was like the perfect storm that started one Saturday about a month or so ago. It might be almost six weeks now. I've been trying to put this together. I've, it's like I said, God keeps dropping information and I audio record it so it doesn't go out my brain. And I finally sat down and kind of put it all together so it makes sense. Um, so, um, and it it's like started on a Saturday. It kind of continued into Sunday. It ended up getting resolved, but we're going to, we're going to, um, go with, with how this, how this played out. I was driving to Bible study and I was listening to a podcast called, the soul of Christianity. And it's a podcast under the 1517.org uh, uh, podcast. You can get them on Spotify or iTunes. I highly rec recommend them all because they're all phenomenal. Forget the labels. Just listen to the content because it's truly, truly some good content in it. Um, but nonetheless, I was listening to it and the, and the soul of Christianity is a podcast that is literally only 12 episodes long. What they did is they broke down the apostles creed and they devote one podcast to each line of the apostles creed. The host interviews somebody and that person is like a, an expert or, um, somebody who has a lot to do or a lot of knowledge about it. And then they kind of take that one line and they break it apart and they, get to the meat of it and so it's not about the labels it's not about catholicism it's not about lutheranism it's it's not really all of that kind of stuff but it breaks it down and gives some fantastic information and you just appreciate it all the more so i highly recommend it it's called the soul of christianity and again it's only 12 episodes so nonetheless so it's really about christ in its essence but i was listening to that episode and um, I will not name the influencer, but um, this person made a TikTok about how he was. There was a girl in his online Bible study who couldn't seem to understand who Paul was. He asked, and this is all I copied this all from his audio. Um, he said, "All you Christians, who is Paul? The Apostle Paul? Who is he?" What is his character? What are his intentions in his writings? What are his thoughts on women? What are his views on sexuality and sex? What are his views on modesty and promiscuity? What are his views on salvific nature? Take everything you know about Paul, sum it up into one sentence, maybe two, and tell me who he is. We have a girl in our live stream Bible study that if you want in on, shoot me a DM and I'll get you in. But she has some views and some thoughts about Paul that we as a group now are trying to come around her to give her some more clarity on who Paul actually was and what he was trying to say in some of these epistles. 
and it has her a little bit flustered. So consider everything you know about Paul from every different place that you've heard everything ever and that has collectively developed your overall view of who he is as a person and explain to me what that is to you. He said, I'm genuinely very curious to see what is the average Christian's view of who Paul was. Try not to give me cookie cutter Christian answers. I mean, truly think about it. Think about what you know about Paul, the things that he said, the things that he's fought for, the things that he's pushed, the things that he's implemented in these churches that he planted. And tell me in a sentence or two, who is Paul? Now, he's not the only one. It just, this is how this played out right? I'm not picking on this one person. I'm not going to even call and tell you his name. We settled once, once we get in it, because when I, when I first read all that, I'm like, my, my literal response to him is, uh, why so much focus on Paul? We aren't Paulians. Paul's thoughts and views are just that eyes on Christ. The only one who died on the cross. To which he responded, Paul wrote or authorized the majority of the Bible you read. That's pretty significant. To which I then replied, uh, and it's also inaccurate what he said, by the way, and I'm getting to that in a minute. I said, I replied, uh, Jesus died on the cross for us. So which is more significant? Red letters or Paul's words? I'll wait. To which he didn't respond at that time. It took him several days to respond, but I'll get to that at the end. I hope I remember to tell you what he responded because we did. We, I mean, we settled it. We talked about it. Like it took a few days because who Lord that ruffled my feathers and he kind of got his feathers ruffled. He did make a TikTok about my response, but he didn't, he didn't slam me. And we, we, we did have further discussion about it. So that's why I'm not calling him out because, um, Cause it ended up being a good thing, but it did. But the great thing about this whole thing is, is I got to do a little bit of research on Paul and I only did a little bit of research cause I didn't have a time to do a whole lot of it, but I still wanted to bring it up because again, I, like I said, he's not the only one. This happens, um, across other platforms and there are other influencers who on Christian TikTok or uh, Instagram or Facebook or, um, where, whatever other social, uh, uh, media platform they use, they kind of get on this tangent about Paul, right? So nonetheless, I keep seeing these people getting so wrapped up in Paul's epistles. Yes, I realize that Paul so greatly loved Jesus Christ. And yes, he did great things for and in the name of Christ to spread the gospel, to convert people to Christianity, to plant churches and to call out those who fell away from the gospel. And he did so at the risk of his own life. Hopefully he converted more Christians than he tortured or killed before his own conversion after his encounter with God on the road to Damascus. In fact, Paul's name was not changed to Paul from Saul by Christ or God. Paul was both Saul and Paul. People link the name change to the encounter with God on the road to Damascus even even after in the scriptures, you'll see God sent Ananias to find Saul and restore his sight after three days. Um, Jesus has always referred to him as Saul. Paul is the one who changed his own name after some time after he believed and began to teach the gospel. Paul was Saul. And was using his Roman name of Paul instead of his Jewish name of Saul, which made it easier for him to approach the Gentiles to preach the gospel and get in with the non-Jewish community. So th there's, there's your first, first myth, myth, bust, myth buster right there. No one changed his name but him. His, he was Saul and Paul simultaneously. He changed it depending on the audience he was talking to. I mean, yes, Paul really did get his world rock. He was rocked. He was blinded for three days, which was enough for him to convert to Christianity after Ananias went and, and healed him. Got, the scales fell off his eyes. 
He then began to obey God's laws and he changed his ways and went out in the name of Jesus to spread the gospel, to plant churches, and again to call out those who fell away from the gospel. And he did so at the risk of his own life. Talk about your suffering servant. I'm not hating on or trying to knock his epistles. They are of great importance for so many reasons. Edification, transformation, conversion, uh, recreation, and he's a great biographical depiction of a true apostle. He mentored Timothy like his own son. He became an ambassador in chains for Christ's actual sake. He sacrificed his life and he died in a Roman prison. He died to self like we are called to do, but it seems like there is some idolatry of Paul going on amongst a lot of Christians, which is really no surprise these days because people can turn anything into an idol, it seems. I'm just not understanding this concept of why people get so wrapped up in Paul because Christ is the one who died on the cross to fulfill the prophecy, to save us from our sins and to give us eternal everlasting life with him, not an everlasting life with Paul. Paul and his epistles are not to be the replacement of Jesus' gospel, which, as you know, today I'm recording this is Good Friday, um, the day that Jesus Christ was crucified. He did a lot of great things for the church, especially in Ephesus. Yes, he said a lot, a lot of beautiful words, but most of what Paul preached and referenced came from Moses and the Psalms and the prophets. He didn't quote much from Christ. And to his credit, it was because he actually accepted the fact that if Christ said it, then it was truly gospel and he didn't need to repeat it. It's not the mystery of the gospel according to Paul. It's the mystery of the gospel of Christ. And again, nothing against Paul, but he was called an apostle by the will of God, not because he studied under Christ like the others. And yes, I will give you that God's calling trumps all things. I'm not disagreeing with that. But there were 12 other apostles and y'all can argue the point all you want about Mary Magdalene, but I'm going to stand on that as one of the honors that she deserves is that she is known as the apostle to the apostles. She walked with Christ and she raised a lot of money for his ministry. In fact, more, there were more women who raised money for Christ's ministry than men. Um, just a little FYI. And yes, in 1969, the Catholic Church finally came out and admitted the slanderous history of Mary Magdalene was not at all true and was made up by Pope Gregory the Great in his sermon in 594 AD. But I digress. Mary Magdalene was known as the Apostle to the Apostles. Why aren't we talking more about that? Why aren't we correcting history? Are we all happy to continue to stick with false narratives? You see why my feathers are ruffled. You don't see people on social media getting all worked up about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Thomas. Well, I'll take that back. You do see some more references to Matthew's and John's Gospels than more, most of the others. But I think you get what I'm saying. And now, thankfully, the Chosen series, I'll give them their credit, is bringing them all to the forefront of history in the mystery of Christ. But you don't see people in Bible studies and social media getting worked up about John. John was the dictator of the book of Revelation since everybody's talking about we're living in the end times. But to be honest, Christ is the actual author of Revelation. John merely wrote what Christ told him to write. And John wrote down what he described about what he saw in Revelation. Jesus Christ is the author. Um, so do I need, do we need to be reminded that it's Christ crucified, not the crucifixion of Paul. Everybody's getting their knickers and knots over Paul, 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 Paul. It's like they're idolizing Paul and Paul's epistles above Christ's words and purpose. Paul had a whole different mission than Christ did. Paul has been elevated to some sort of Christian second Jesus type of importance, rock star status or equal to Christ on earth. And while Paul may be one of the greatest apostles, he certainly does not deserve to be elevated to that kind of status. I mean, what would be the point of Christ if that happened, right? So when Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and Satan was trying to tempt him, Jesus didn't respond with, well, the apostle Paul said, Jesus said, it is written. 
etc. And he rebuked Satan with the written word of God. Paul is not the one who was brought to Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate didn't ask the Romans, which one do you want to be released? Barabbas or Paul? It's not called the passion of Paul. Paul didn't give the Sermon on the Mount. Paul isn't the one who has seen the Father. Paul isn't the one who has divine connection because he is the Father, God incarnate. That's who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit of Paul is not who lives in us as a gift from God to help guide us for the rest of our days until Christ returns. Um, Jesus did bestow upon all of his apostles, including Paul, to do healing and miracles, signs, wonders, etc. in the name of Christ, not in the name of Paul. Paul wasn't even at the Last Supper. Paul didn't even hear about who Christ, the Messiah, actually was until the stoning of Stephen, circa 36 AD. So while Paul's heart is postured towards a Christian furtherance of the kingdom through Christ's gospel, it is through Christ that we get to go to God, our Father, not because of Paul. We are not Paulians. We are Christians. That's why I keep telling you, you need to stick to the words in red letters because those are the words that Jesus Christ himself said. It's not Paul the Christ, it's Jesus Christ. There were 12 disciples. And if we are to learn scripture and use that scripture for edification in the cases of resisting Satan, refuting other religious theologies or for apologetics, we're going to have to go with Jesus's words and respond with, it is written and the faith is X, Y, and Z. It's not, well, even though Jesus died on the cross and snatched the keys of Hades and death and was then resurrected on the third day, exchanged with, well, the apostle Paul said this. It's not, that's, that's not how that works. I'm not, I am, I am going to proselytize my, from my face faith by what Jesus did for me. I am not going to proselytize for my faith because what the epistles that Paul wrote. Yes, I do say that Paul did a lot of great proselytizing. I hate that word. I cannot say that word. I guess the word for it is that's what he did is he went out and he preached the gospel. He was a gracious person enough to take in Timothy under his wing and mentor Timothy because toward the end he knew he was fixing to die. He passed it on. He passed the torch on to Timothy and that's a great thing. But the Bible is not about the life of Paul, even though he is credited with writing several of the epistles in the New Testament, 13 or 14 of them attributed to him, but truly only seven or eight of these Pauline, Pauline epistles are accepted as being entirely authentic and dictated by Paul himself, which kind of begs the question, well, if Paul didn't write him, then who did? Who dictated him? Was it Timothy? Was it Tychicus? Possibly. He's referred to at the end of Ephesians. But honestly, the Bible is the love story that God wrote out for all of us. We don't see the foreshadowing of a ram to represent Paul being caught in a thicket when Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac. We don't hear about John the Baptist talking about, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and points to Paul. And we don't see the prophets prophesying about Paul. The Old Testament and the prophecies that needed to be fulfilled and have been fulfilled thus far are all about Jesus Christ. The New Testament is not just a testament to Jesus' finished work on the cross. It's the testament of what Jesus did for us. Romans 5, 8. Yes, it goes on with Romans, Hebrews, Ephesians, the Colossians, the Philippians, and of course the Corinthians, and all of the rest of those in the New Testament. Jesus' half-brothers books, James, the first... Second, third, John and the book of Jude and all of those things are in the New Testament. But refer back to 1 Corinthians and the crucifixion. That's more of what we need to teach about. The crucifixion and the death, not just the resurrection. It's all of it. It's the Friday, it's the Saturday, and the Sunday. And it's not just the crucifixion. It's not just the stealing, going to hell and stealing the keys of Hades and death. And it's not just the resurrection. It all needs to be talked about. It needs to be brought to the forefront more so than what Paul did 
while he was on earth. <clears throat> it still is Christ's directive to go out and proclaim the gospel of Christ, the mystery of the gospel of Christ, not the mystery of how Saul became Paul, not the mystery or the reason that Paul didn't die on the cross. Paul is only as equal as John, Mar uh, Matthew, Luke, Mark, Mary, etc. And yes, I'm going to say Mary Magdalene because she's the one who found the empty tomb along with Jesus' mother, thus earning her the title, the Apostle to the Apostles. And I'm doing a study on Mary Magdalene right now. I'm about to rock y'all world so y'all get prepared for that. It's going to be a while on that one because I just started it. Um, there should be equal study to support other people than just Paul. I mean, people aren't getting wrapped up in Matthew. They aren't talking about Stephen. People aren't talking about Simon Peter. If, by the way, I have to keep saying because everybody gets hyper-focused on how Judas is the one who betrayed Christ. Judas knew. I mean, Jesus knew that too. But for whatever reason, Judas went out and decided to hang himself. And it's said that the real reason that Judas is being tormented in hell for all this time is because he wasn't really a true disciple or a true believer of Christ the Messiah. And so why are we not also mentioning the fact that Simon Peter denied Jesus Christ three times, which is in an in and of itself a betrayal, not the selling out of, but if you're looking at it in proper context, God had to use somebody, I guess, to get Jesus to be arrested so he could get nailed to the cross to fulfill the prophecies foreshadowed in the Old Testament. And another thing. If we're going to be mentioning Judas, 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 then you also have to mention Simon Peter, Simon Peter, Simon Peter, because not Paul, but Christ through his infinite mercy, graciousness, forgiveness, and wisdom forgave Simon Peter and made him the rock on which he built his church. That's why we aspire to be as Christians, not Paulians. Now, I'm not God and I don't know what would have happened to Judas would he have stayed alive. Like literally, let's think about that for just a second. What do you think would have happened to Judas? What are the chances that he could have been killed? Because, you know, when they figure out who Christ really is in the end, then they may have killed Judas because he actually did betray Christ. Something else to think about at the very same time. It's also mentioned that all of the apostles were all in hiding for fear of their lives. So, you know, God had to do his thing the way he chose to do it, which was to, I guess, select Judas. And maybe Judas really didn't believe in Christ the Messiah. So God used Judas to betray Christ to get him arrested. But Jesus already knew this was coming. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. He even said it on the cross. It is finished. To tell us die, right? It is finished. I believe in the Bible and the word of God in everything in the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's why I include the comment about the words in red as being more important than the words in Paul. Because we are not Paulians. We are Christians. God didn't have Judas betray Paul. So we need to stop hyper-focusing on all these attributes of Paul. Yes, it is great to acknowledge Paul for his faith. Like I said, I wish I could be as dedicated, devoted, and as disciplined as Paul was. But all the things that he did for the kingdom, they're still getting hyper-focused, and everybody seems to be coming across as Paulinians instead of keeping their eyes on Christ and living as Christians. I mean, read the whole entire Bible, get into the awesomeness that is the Old Testament, which I'm going to be the first one to tell you that when I was younger and I tried reading the Old Testament, I had no clue. I was lost. I had no clue what it was about. I was raised Catholic, but we never opened our Bibles. I have a Bible that's probably this thick and it's in pristine condition. And I am 53 years old and I think my parents bought it before I was born. It's still sitting in the same corner of the bookcase at my daddy's house. I pulled that thing out a few times and tried reading it. I had no clue what they were talking about because it wasn't the same stuff I learned in church. I was raised in church. Um, we went to church. The priest didn't even give a sermon about what they about what the readings were about that they just read moments before. And so, uh, like it was in our missalettes, so we read it, we followed along. Then the priest gave a sermon, which had, except for Christmas and 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 Easter, that's the only time it ever correlated with what we just what the readings were. 
We even went to catechism, but to be honest, our catechism teachers were basically glorified babysitters. Because when we were younger, they give you like pages to color and they're like, here, color the nativity scene. Here, color the Star of Bethlehem. Here, color the Christmas tree. And they did te teach us a little bit about um, the way to learn our prayers. They did teach us the Apostles' Creed. They made us learn the Apostles' Creed. They made us learn the Nicene Creed, which is why I mentioned the soul of Christianity earlier in this, um, this YouTube. Um, they made us learn the Our Father. They made us learn the Glory Be. They made us go before the priest to do our, you know, our first confession when we, you know, became confirmed. We went through all of that, but we really didn't learn anything. I've learned more as an adult on my own than I ever did ever in the 40 plus years prior to me giving my life to Christ as an adult. Um, they made us memorize our prayers that was our catechism teacher's focus because there were more about the prayer, the rituals, and the rosaries. I don't think they even forced us to learn how to say a rosary because I don't remember ever being forced to say the rosary. I remember watching and listening to my mom recite a rosary, and I remember the rosaries being done at funerals and not knowing better before I understood because I was still under the age of 18. I didn't know better. I just believed the words my parents told me and I had no frame of reference. So when I was older, I in my er, uh, early to mid 20s, I taught myself how to say a, ros a rosary. And I was a semi-practicing Catholic, if I'm being honest. But I wasn't walking with Christ at that time because I didn't know better. Um, I had to identify identified myself as Catholic because that's all I knew how to do. My parents did it, so that's what I did. I didn't have people around me to educate me and teach me better, so you know I taught myself how to say the rosary. And I'd say a rosary every morning, and we lived in my grandparents' house whenever um, my second husband and I got married. When my grandmother passed away, they had this black velvet painting of the agony in the garden because it was popular in the day to have this black velvet painting. It was a home interior thing painting that she had. But the truth is, is when I was saying that rosary, I was saying it, um, looking up at this black velvet painting of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane with the glorious light of God shining upon him. So I would say a rosary in front of that picture in adoration of Jesus Christ. It never once entered my mind that I was idolat I, doing an idolatry thing with a rosary to Mary. That like it didn't connect in my head. And I'm not trying to slam Mary. Mary ha deserves to have a place of honor. She is the mother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as is Joseph. But I'm not going to pray to them when I can go directly to the source. And that concept has never made sense in my brain which is why I never fit in with Catholicism. So when I was saying that rosary in front of that picture was in adoration of Jesus Christ and, and his, his crucifixion, um, you know, and then you get to the end of the, of, of the rosary and it's like the hail Holy queen. And honestly, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just that naive or I just that dedicated more to Christ than anything. I still never put it together that it was, you know, being idolatrous to Mary instead of praying to Jesus and God. Like I just never, I never connected the dots for whatever reason. So anyway, so yeah, so like I taught myself to say the rosary and I used to do that. My mom and I did a rosary a couple of times together. I do a rosary almost every day when I was pregnant with my middle daughter in front of that picture. But in my brain, I was doing it. I was saying the rosary, but I was had Jesus on my mind, not Mary. But that question always was in my head. Once I became a teenager and I learned to be more observant from the outside in, I always question, why are y'all praying to Mary and Joseph? Yes, they have a special place in history. And yes, they are the parents of our Lord and Savior. And it's sad that they suffered and died. But they are buried along with all of the other dead saints who were buried and uh, experienced miracles and who were canonized and all that. But the truth is, is we are also referred to as saints. Yes, some of us may have experienced actual miracles with God. Um, I, I certainly have, but I'm not going to be canonized as a saint. That's, that's not how that, that, that doesn't, that's not how that works for me. Um, but, but to be honest, I'm going to ask you this honestly. Isn't every day a miracle? 
I mean, we, we, today we acknowledge today is the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. As we were, we are still sinners, but he still did it for us because God loved us and Jesus made the way for us to have our intimate relationship with him and for us to get closer to uh, God, our creator, through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is a gift from God. So why are we focusing so much on Paul? I just, I'm not understanding it. So, like I said, Jesus is the one who died on the cross to give us life, save us from our sins, and give us the opportunity to repent and obey and have a relationship with him and God, our creator, and they gifted us with the Holy Spirit. We're not obeying to Paul, but it seems like he's becoming the Christian Mary. So that's what I've been observing on social media, and I hear almost as much, if not more, about Paul as I do Jesus Christ. And I don't understand that. So thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Let's get it straight, y'all. Revelation, we are living in the end times. And really, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to land the plane with this. All glory and honor to God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's, 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 my, that's what I got to say. Peace, love, and Jesus. <laughs>